All right, in module 10, um, we are going to be talking about support systems, in other words, the cerebrospinal fluid system and the vascular system of the brain, and um, stroke, which is a really interesting area of rehabilitation. No matter what setting you work in in PT, you will um, eventually meet someone who has had a stroke, even if you are not specifically doing stroke rehab. So you're going to see people with CVAs in acute care, in subacute, in outpatient, um, and it's a really uh, interesting area. I love working with um, CVA patients. So chapter 24 is on the cerebral spinal fluid. It's a lovely short little chapter, um, and so hopefully this will be a lovely short little lecture as well. The learning objectives for this lecture is I want you to be able to list the primary functions of cerebral spinal fluid and briefly describe the flow of it. It's, uni it's uh, unidirectional, I'll just tell you that. Um, I want you to be able to list the pathology and signs and symptoms of a few um, CSF brain circulation disorders, um, epidural and subdural hematomas, hydrocephalus and meningitis. So we will briefly talk about them all. So the CSF system regulates the extracellular milieu and protects the central nervous system. So it determines which um, nutrients and chemicals are going to be um, in the extracellular fluid. It um, provides some buoyancy um, to the nervous system and some a little bit of fluid protection of the brain. Um, CSF is formed primarily in the ventricles and it circulates through the ventricles and into the subarachnoid space in a unidirectional manner. Um, and then from the subarachnoid space it is reabsorbed into the venous circulation. So um, cerebral spinal fluid supplies water, certain um, essential amino acids, and specific ions to the extracellular fluid in the brain. And probably, although the mechanism isn't fully known, it probably removes metabolites from the brain as well. Um, so we know that the glial cells have some um, nutritive and um, cleanup functions, and the CSF um, helps out with that as well. So the CSF-filled spaces inside the brain form a system of four ventricles. There are two later lateral ventricles, one in each cerebral hemisphere, and um, there's, they have a body, an atrium, anterior, posterior, and inferior horns. You don't need to know that. Um, then the um, um, interventricular foramen drains into the third ventricle. Um, the, from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle, there is a passage called the cerebral aqueduct. And then from the fourth ventricle, it goes into the subarachnoid space, which then it gets reabsorbed into the venous circulation. So it's that one-way flow, lateral ventricles, interventricular foramen, third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle, subarachnoid space. Okay, that's just the one-way flow. And this is the, you can sort of, this is sort of the uh, flat 3D version, if you want to think of it that way. Um, but you can see how having that um, fluid sort of inner core of the brain provides a little bit of cushioning. So um, we talked about the meninges in the very first chapter. Um, we talked about them again in the spinal cord chapter, and then we're going to talk about them again <laughs> in this chapter. So the three layers of the meninges cover the brain and the spinal cord. The dura mater is the outer layer. It's, t it's a tough layer that surrounds the brain, um, and it, the outer layer is firmly bound to the inside of the skull. And then it has an inner layer um, the arachnoid is a delicate membrane loosely attached to that inner layer of the dura. And then the pia mater is tightly opposed to the surfaces of the brain and the spinal cord. So there are potential spaces between the dura mater and the brain and the dura mater and the arachnoid. And we'll talk about those um, with regard to pathology. So some of the CSF is formed by extracellular fluid leaking into the ventricles but most of it is secreted by choroid plexuses in the ventricles. Um, it's formed from blood by filtration, active transport, and facilitated transport of certain substances. So um, there are, the choroid plexus is a network of capillaries that's embedded in the connective tissue of the ventricles. 
And um, there are three layers of cells um, that perform that filtration of the blood. Um, so you get a, a fluid that's similar to plasma, except it has some, uh, some chemical differences. So um, basically it flows from the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle via the interventricular foramina. Um, and from the third ventricle into the fourth via the cerebral aqueduct, and then it exits the fourth ventricle um, into the arachnoid, the subarachnoid space. And within that subarachnoid space, it flows around the brain and the spinal cord. And it's absorbed um, back into the venous sinuses. So th the unidirectional flow is sort of a way of controlling what is in the cerebral spinal fluid. So that's kind of one of the um, hallmarks of cerebral spinal fluid is that unidirectional flow. So common disorders of the cerebral spinal fluid include um, hematomas. It can be epidural and subdural. We'll talk about them. Usually as a consequence of trauma. Um, hydrocephalus, which is, you can think of it as water in the brain, so excess fluid. Um, and meningitis, which is inflammation of the meninges that's caused by either bacterial or viral infections. Um, hematomas are usually the consequence of trauma. So normally you, you have that potential space between the dura and the skull and between the dura and the arachnoid, and bleeding into either one of those spaces can cause separation of the layers, um, resulting in an epidural or subdural hematoma. So an epidural hematoma results from arterial bleeding between the skull and the dura mater. Um, most often epidural hematomas occur when the middle meningeal artery is torn by a fracture of the temporal or parietal bone. Um, because the arteries bleed rapidly, the signs and symptoms develop quickly. And so it's often a blow to the head um, which causes this epidural hematoma. And the person might have a few hours of normal function after a blow to the head, and then they might develop a worsening headache, vomiting, decreased consciousness, hemiparesis, and Babinski sign. So in contrast, the subdural hematoma is caused by venous bleeding between the dura and the arachnoid. So it's underneath the dura, subdural. Since it's venous bleeding, the bleeding is slower and the onset of symptoms is more gradual and over a more prolonged period. So with an epidural hematoma, you might have um, development of symptoms within the um, first few hours. Uh, with a subdural hematoma, it could take days to months. So um, with the exception of the rate of progression, the signs and symptoms are similar. Um, so confusion, um, decreased consciousness, headache, vomiting, interparalysis, and some other things. So both types of hematoma are potentially life-threatening because as the fluid builds up, neural tissue is compressed and displaced. So the subdural hematoma is the one where someone has a closed head injury, like a skier versus tree accident or something, they do not seek medical attention and they die a couple days later. Um, so the, um, it's something that you definitely want to think about when you have a closed head injury. Um, you wanna rule out those um, hematomas because they can be life-threatening. So with hydrocephalus, um, it occurs if the CSF circulation is blocked and um, pressure builds up in the ventricles. Common causes include failure of the fourth ventricle um, foramina to open. It can be in congenital, um, so that someone's born with it. Um, it could be a blockage of the cerebral aqueduct. That is probably the most common. Um, certain types of cysts and Arnold Cherry malformations can affect um, the flow of CSF. So hydrocephalus is um, characterized as communicating or non-communicating. And in communicating, the ventricular system is intact and a blockage exists beyond the fourth ventricle. So somewhere between where the fourth ventricle has flowed into the subarachnoid space, there's some sort of blockage.
Um, in non-communicating, which is also called obstructive, the blockage is within the ventricular system itself, and it's most often in the cerebral aqueduct. So, um, with with children, uh, with very young children, the cranial bones haven't fused yet. So excessive CSF pressure causes the ventricles and hemispheres and cranium to expand. So signs of hydrocephalus in an infant or a young child can include a disproportionately large head, a large anterior fontanelle, so the forehead, um, poor feeding, uh, inactivity, um, and a downward gaze of the eyes, and that's from compression of the oculomotor nerve. So the, the um, motor nerves in the eyes just don't work as well. So um, in older children and adults, because the cranium can't expand, excessive pressure in the ventricles compresses the nervous tissue, um, particularly the white matter. So it can commonly result in gait or balance impairments, um, incontinence, and headache. So there is a, um, sometimes frontal lobe functions are affected, so emotions, planning, memory, and intellect. Um, but usually language and spatial awareness and memory are not affected. So um, causes of acquired rather than congenital hydrocephalus can include traumatic brain injury, um, intraventricular hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, or um, diseases such as meningitis. There's another form of acquired hydrocephalus, and this is generally seen in adults, and it's called normal pressure hydrocephalus, and it can, um, it can be a problem in CSF metabolism. Um, it can, a lot of times it's idiopathic, but um, regardless of the cause, a lot of times the way they treat hydrocephalus is by implanting a shunt, um, and the shunt is with a one-way valve is implanted to drain the um, ventricle and it goes all the way down into the peritoneum and the fluid is absorbed back into the system. So in a lot of cases the shunts remain in place permanently. So I mean, that's the treatment for hydrocephalus. I, I worked with one older man who had normal pressure hydrocephalus and um, we were working on gait and balance, of course. He he could get pretty overloaded, though, cognitive overload. And I, I think that's sort of the frontal lobe effects. Um, if if he got too overloaded, if we were in a in the gym and it was too crowded, or um, he was really tired or something like that, he had much more difficulty with balance and gait. Um, so a lot of times, um, working in a quiet room. Um, making sure he's not too tired, taking appropriate rest breaks um, was really helpful. So um, he had a shunt in place and um, he was improving. He was he came in walk with the walker and he um, eventually was able to go to uh, trekking poles or a cane. So that's pretty good. Meningitis is um, really inflammation of the membranes that surround the brain or spinal cord, and it's usually bacterial or viral in um, origin. The signs and symptoms include headache, fever, confusion, vomiting, and this the PowerPoint says neck sickness, but it means neck stiffness. <laughs> so you can imagine if there's inflammation in the meninges, how that could result in neck stiffness. So um, I'll try to correct that before I post the PowerPoint in the module. <laughs> So next stiffness. Craniosacral therapy um, is a manual therapy technique, and the the claims are that it evaluates and treats the CSF system. The people who do craniosacral therapy um, say that uh, CSF production is periodic, and that you can um, detect the cranial sacral rhythm, and you can um, affect it in some way. At this point, there's no evidence. It's it's not been conclusively demonstrated, um, but I have um, talked with people. So this is just anecdotal evidence who have had um, reduction in migraines with craniosacral therapy and some other things. So um, you'll hear about it. It's it's in the chapter because um, 
it is um, supposed to evaluate and treat the central, uh, the cerebral spinal fluid system. Whether it does or not is uh, out there remains to be proved.